Today I'd like to talk about um, the use of multi-detector CT in the evaluation of patients with blunt abdominal uh, trauma. Um, first, um, I'd like to let you, for everybody know that this is a significant uh, um, uh, public health uh, concern. Uh, it's the third leading cause of death in the United States. It's the most common cause of death in patients or in persons who are less than 40 years of age. And there are close to 200,000 deaths every, uh, this year um, and several million uh, injuries. Um, so a significant problem. We're going to be focusing our attention on blunt abdominal trauma, not on penetrating injury. Uh, first of all, uh, patients... Uh, who benefit from abdominal CT are those with severe injuries who are hemodynamically stable. There's nothing worse than having a patient who's unstable on your CT scanner. Uh, the physical examination cannot be performed optimally, usually due to altered mental status, usually drugs, alcohol, or head injuries. Patients with uh, lumbar or pelvic fractures uh, are prone to have significant intra-abdominal injuries and when there's equivocal physical findings. We'd like to give oral contrast. Uh, even if it's given 10 minutes prior to the exam, it's helpful. Most bowel injuries that occur are usually within the, in the, in the proximal uh, uh, bowel, the stomach, duodenum, proximal jejunum. So even if you can get it past the ligament of trites, it's helpful. You'd like to reduce artifact and certainly multi-detector CT has the ability to do this. The fast imaging time has, uh, has uh, caused us to uh, virtually eliminate uh, motion and uh, respiratory artifact. Um, arms and monitoring leads uh, would be nice to get off the field of view. It's very helpful. Um, IV contrast is mandatory. Uh, there is really, as opposed to head CT, there is no indication um, for patients in blunt abdominal trauma to have a non-contrast scan. We like to give about 150 uh, milliliters at two to, three centimeters, two to three cc's a second. Children receive uh, two to three uh, milliliters of contrast per kilogram. Now, there are methods to improve diagnostic accuracy. One is it's mandatory to view, to view the lung windows to look for lung contusions and pneumothoraces. Uh, and you always scan the abdomen and pelvis because of fluid, the way the fluid or hemoperitoneum layers. So it's, despite the fact that you may have a patient with only upper abdominal injury, you always scan through the pubic symphysis. We like to initiate scanning 70 to 80 seconds after uh, contrast is given. Um, it's not uh, mandatory to do it during the arterial phase. Uh, you will still see active extravasation of contrast if it's present uh, when you're using multi-detector scanning, even at 70 seconds. I like to give around uh, 3 cc's a second. Sometimes you have to rescan the kidneys at about 4 minutes to make sure there's no injury to the parenchyma or the collecting system. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. Collimation is 2.5 to 5 millimeters. Now, the attenuation of hemoperitoneum. Um, it doesn't look the same as it does in the brain. And the reason for that is that the, there's a much higher attenuation of the organs in the abdomen as opposed to the brain. Uh, the CT number of uh, the uh, liver is approximately 60 to 65, uh, much higher than the, than the white matter or gray matter of the brain. Now, lice blood uh, has a CT number around 35 to 45 Hounsville units, while clotted blood is in the area of uh, 60 to 80 Hounsville units. The most important finding, or one of the most important findings when you're looking for injury to viscera is the so-called sentinel clot sign, and that's where blood has the highest attenuation adjacent to the site of bleeding. So if you have a subcapsular hematoma or a laceration at the periphery of the liver, the blood there will be higher in attenuation than anywhere else. Now, the significance of interperitoneal fluid is the only CT finding, and this is, uh, gets into a lot of uh, interesting uh, areas. One is that if there's a small amount of free fluid, especially in, the, in a female patient uh, who is uh, uh, less than 50 years of, old, years of age, that is premenopausal, uh, you treat, usually treat conservatively. Larger amounts of uh, free fluid or blood 
without significant intra-abdominal injury, you've got to worry about mesenteric or bowel injuries. Uh, if the fluid, even if the fluid in an acute injury is less than 20 Hounsfield units, you cannot dismiss it as ascites. That's because active bowel peristalsis uh, can cause the fluid or hemoperitoneum to look like acidic fluid even though it's not. So don't dismiss low attenuation fluid as, uh, as ascites and not hemoperitoneum. Now, as you all know, uh, when patients are lying on a stretcher, uh, the hemoperitoneum collects in the most dependent locations. First in the pelvis, secondly in the right pericolic gutter because it's wider and deeper. Also in Morrison's pouch, which is the most dependent portion of the abdomen in the uh, um, upper abdomen, I should say, and in the right subphrenic space. This is a typical demonstration of, fr of fluid both in a cadaver that was injected and in a patient with active bleeding. And you can see the, the uh, fluid in the uh, paravesical fossa here and up the uh, pericolic gutters. And you, can still, and you can see the high density hemoperitoneum in the pelvis in this patient with a severe splenic injury. And you can say that this is, this is hemoperitoneum and not ascites. You can see the relatively high attenuation of this fluid in the dependent areas of the pelvis. Now, this is a procedure that uh, came prior to CT. I don't think too many people do it at this point. It's a sensitive test, and it's easy to perform by the surgeons, but it's not better than CT. And secondly, it doesn't uh, differentiate significant from inconsequential injuries, and you cannot detect retroperitoneal injuries. So it's, a, it's really a test of the past. Now, let's talk about the spleen because it's the most commonly injured organ uh, in patients with blunt abdominal trauma. CT is highly accurate in the area of the high 90% range with multi-detector CT in determining the site and extent of splenic injury. And uh, hemoperitoneum is always present when there is a capsular disruption. Now, there are a couple of uh, limitations uh, which can be confusing, but if you closely look at the CT scan, I think most of these caveats can be picked up. One are splenic clefts, and they're usually on the inner surface of the spleen as opposed to the outer surface. And they're usually lined with fat and not blood, like you'd see in a patient with a sentinel clot sign after a disrupted splenic capsule. Uh, occasionally, the elongation of the left lobe of the liver can touch the spleen. It can simulate a laceration. And arterial phase image, when it's too early, cause a, causes an inhomogeneous enhancement pattern of the spleen that can simulate uh, to the inexperienced eye a splenic uh, contusion. So that's why another reason that you don't want to scan too early. Now, there's another entity that uh, really it has to be talked about, and that's why most patients with left upper quadrant injury, only with, even with minor splenic changes on the early scans, must, on the early scans, meaning right after they are injured, must be uh, monitored closely for several days because there is an entity called delayed splenic rupture. This does not occur on any other organ, and it can be catastrophic. It, it can occur anywhere from 3 to uh, 12 to 14 days after the initial injury. And some of those initial injuries are relatively, seem to be relatively minor. Now, this is an example of uh, the inhomogeneous enhancement of the, um, of the spleen. It's analogous to the cortical medullary uh, uh, phase imaging of the, um, of the kidney where there, you can see the inhomogeneity. Now, if you took this scan another 20 seconds delayed, you'd see this all fill in normally, and this would be an absolutely normal spleen like that. This is an example of a splenic cleft. In this particular case, it's on the outer surface of the spleen, not as common as on the inner surface, but you can see it's lined with fat. It's very sharply marginated and should not be confused with a splenic laceration. Now, there is really no good CT grading system to predict the clinical outcome in patients. There have been a number that have been tried. None of them work. There's only a couple of uh, CT findings that are very helpful in determining what to do in the management of these patients. One is the presence of a 
pseudoaneurysm that occurs at the hilus or within the spleen, and secondly is active extravasation. And both of these warrants either surgical exploration, usually a splenectomy, I'm sorry to say, or a better approach in a relatively stable patient would be interventional radiology embolization. This is an example of active extravasation of contrast material. We can see um, the large laceration in the spleen, a very large subcapsular hematoma, and the active hemorrhage that we see here extending from the spleen into the peri, uh, perisplenic uh, hematoma. This case calls for most likely immediate surgery. Uh, because these people will not stay stable for long. Another um, common manifestation of a severe splenic injury are these small pseudoaneurysms that occur. And even if you don't see active bleeding, if you do see these uh, discrete contrast-enhanced foci, these are small pseudoaneurysms, and these must be treated more aggressively, usually with selective embolization. Now, sometimes splenic injuries can be chronic. Um, now, this patient ha actually had a partial splenectomy years prior to this exam for a splenic injury. He presented with some difficulty breathing because of an elevated left hemidiaphragm, which turned out to be a, um, a uh, ruptured left hemidiaphragm that was chronic. And we can see the diaphragmatic leaflets here, which are completely ruptured, and the posterior one here. Now, you know what these small left upper quadrant soft tissue densities are. This is splenosis, little fragments of spleen that uh, remained after the uh, shattered uh, spleen was uh, removed. So he still has some splenic function even though he supposedly had a splenectomy. So these problems can occur years later and sometimes these diaphragmatic injuries uh, are not caught in time or not caught at the time of the exploration and uh, this led to some difficulty with breathing for long periods of time. And sometimes, uh, even in the relatively acute phase, these, last, these um, diaphragmatic injuries um, can take several days or even up to a week to develop uh, after positive pressure ventilation. This, when this patient first came in, his diaphragm was at a normal level. However, about eight days later, we can see the markedly elevated diaphragm, the so-called collar sign, where there was probably herniation of viscera through a defect in the diaphragm. And the CT scan show, showed rupture of this diaphragmatic leaflet here, anteriorly and posteriorly here. This is a complete diaphragmatic uh, laceration that was only detected late in the course of this uh, patient's hospitalization. Now, bowel and mesenteric injuries can be very important because they may not be associated with any other injuries, and because of the slow leakage of gastrointestinal contents can be life-threatening and lead to a high, can lead to a very high morbidity and mortality rate if not explored. Now, there are some findings that you can see. One is free fluid. Sometimes you can see mesenteric infiltration or sort of a misty mesentery in the fat adjacent to the injured bowel loop. Uh, on occasion, you can see focal bowel wall thickening or enhancement, and rarely you have free air. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't occur, but because usually in bowel injury there is lack of peristalsis, uh, free air or extraluminal uh, contrast is not the usual finding. So sometimes only free fluid or mesenteric infiltration or bowel wall thickening are the only manifestations of a bowel or mesenteric injury. Now, this is an old scan. This is what we used to see on occasion, an upper GI in a patient with an intramural hematoma of the duodenum. This patient was an alcoholic, never realized or uh, didn't remember falling, presented uh, to the hospital with uh, severe vomiting, unable to eat, and we can see this uh, intramural mass, which happened to be a hematoma that was evacuated uh, after the upper GI exam was performed. Another patient who had a duodenal rupture after blunt abdominal trauma, and we can see the extravasation of contrast and air bubbles into the anterior perirenal uh, fascial planes here, 
And if this is not picked up immediately, the patient has a significant mortality and morbidity. Uh, retro, occult retroperitoneal perforations, as you know, can lead to a significant retroperitoneal inflammatory infection that spreads rapidly and can lead quickly to death. Uh, an unusual but uh, uh, finding, we see a patient who had blunt abdominal trauma after a steering wheel accident, and on the initial scan, this was not picked up. There's a faint mesenteric area of thickening, which happened to be a mesenteric hematoma adjacent to the ascending colon and cecum. Three days later, after he was unable to pass gas and became very distended, we repeated the scan, and we can see that this hematoma has significantly increased in size. This was due to a venous bleed into the mesentery, a massive hematoma that actually obstructed the flow of contrast uh, through this area. And in this particular case, the hematoma and portion of the cecum had to be, uh, had to be resected uh, so the patient um, could uh, live a, a normal life again. But this was a very significant mesenteric hemorrhage that uh, didn't present itself uh, until several days after the initial blunt injury via seatbelt. Another patient who you think perhaps, well, this may be diverticulitis, except there was no history of diverticulitis. He was hit with a baseball bat in the lower abdomen, um, somebody trying to uh, steal some property from him. And you can see this mesenteric inflammation and thickening and these small pseudoaneurysms, which are in the sigmoid mesentery. Now, when you have something like this, uh, and you know there's been blunt trauma, this is not a case for watchful waiting. You have to tell the surgeon there has been significant mesenteric injury, and this had to be explored, because it was only the mesentery most likely to heal, but there's no way you can exclude a partial injury to the, uh, or, or laceration of the sigmoid colon in this kind of, kind of patient, and you really need to have them explored. And this patient was explored. It was limited to the sigmoid mesentery, and he did fine. Uh, but when you do have a finding like this in the mesentery, they, the surgery has to be involved. Now, there's an entity in CT uh, of blunt trauma that can occur in both adults and children. It was originally described in children, but it's called the hyper, hypoperfusion complex. And it's uh, an entity where you see diffuse bowel wall dilatation in fluid. You have intense enhancement of the bowel wall, the mesentery, and kidneys. And you may have decreased caliber of the aorta and IVC. Now, usually this entity is due to uh, significant blood loss. And the patient should, usually should not be on the CT scan, or they should be in the OR. And you can see an example of this in an adult who happened to have an aortic laceration. You can see a large uh, mediastinal hematoma, an NG tube, an endotracheal tube, in place a confined laceration of the arch and descending thoracic aorta. But because of the significant blood loss, you can see the hypoperfusion complex, very dense enhancement of the kidneys, uh, flat IVC, intense bowel wall thickening and fluid in the bowel wall, and a large amount of hemoperitoneum in the abdomen. You also happen to have a significant liver laceration with, uh, um, which extended beyond the capsule. Now, renal injuries um, are evaluated, uh, and this is one entity where you can classify, and it does make a difference on how you handle these patients. There are five ca classifications. One is a simple contusion or a small subcapsular hematoma. Second, you can have a perirenal hematoma, and the laceration is less than one centimeter, and there's no urine extravasation. The third type is where the laceration is greater than a centimeter, and yet there's no uh, urine, lacer uh, urine uh, extravasation. The fourth type is more complex, where you can have both a collecting system injury or a vascular injury. And on the, four, on the fifth, uh, which you, there's no further function in the kidney, is the so-called shattered uh, parenchyma. And uh, surgery is usually required. Thank goodness it's a very, very rare entity. This is a, um, a significant or a type 4 uh, renal injury after an automobile accident, where you can see there's delayed contrast uh, enhancement, 
uh, and you can see there's a large perinephric hematoma, and you can see active extravasation because there's a significant laceration of the parenchyma of the kidney, and you can see it extending into the perinephric and posterior perirenal fascial plane surrounding that left kidney. Now, despite the fact that the quality of this image is poor, it happened to be on a famous Chicago Bear uh, quarterback. This was uh, from no early November of 1984, uh, where a quarterback in the uh, Chicago Bears, who eventually led them to a Super Bowl, received a significant elbow to the uh, flank from an Oakland, Oakland Raider at that time. And uh, he was brought to the emergency room of Northwestern, and you can see on this image, there was a significant grade four injury where act, there was active extravasation of contrast material, an area of ischemia, and a large perinephric hematoma in this, uh, in this athlete. Uh, within a month, he recovered. The kidney looked uh, as good as normal, except for a little bit of scarring in the upper pole. Now, occasionally you can be fooled. Patients can present with minor, relatively minor trauma, which sometimes radiologists don't realize it's minor, uh, and severe flank pain, and ask us, we're doing a CT scan, and we see a large perinephric hematoma in this particular case, except this happened to be a ruptured renal cell carcinoma that presented as a perinephric uh, hematoma. So you must be very careful, and at times you're going to see cases like this where the amount of trauma was relatively minor, although we're not privy to that information, and you may see an act, uh, act of bleeding from a small perinephric hematoma, um, a perinephric uh, a hematoma, which is re really the cause was a renal cell carcinoma. Adrenal injuries are relatively uncommon. They're usually not associated with any significant long-term sequela. Uh, they are most often associated with ipsilateral thoracic or abdominal injuries, and uh, the right adrenal, because of its more fixed, low, uh, fixed position, is more prone to injury than the left. Two examples uh, I've had in the last couple of years of isolated adrenal injuries, perinephric, excuse me, peri, uh, adrenal hemorrhage on the right in this particular case, and a large one on the left with a normal left kidney. And you can see the infiltration of the cruce of the diaphragm and the perinephric uh, fascial plane secondary to this large left side of the adrenal hematoma due to blunt trauma. Now, liver is important to evaluate. Uh, the right lobe is, is involved in most cases. The left lobe injuries are usually a straight vector force, and they may be associated with injuries to the uh, duodenum or pancreas. Uh, hepatic injuries um, usually are lower in attenuation unless you have a diseased liver. When you have a fatty liver, the laceration can appear hyper or iso intense uh, and there, iso dense and uh, can be sometimes uh, difficult to appreciate. These are two very obvious examples of significant injury to the uh, liver. Huge lacerations in this patient in the right lobe that extended to the capsule. And another patient, the only thing preserving her was this large perinephric, excuse me, peri subcapsular hematoma, which um, prevented her from bleeding out. Very large right sided um, parenchymal uh, laceration, which generally takes the course of the renal vasculature. Not unusual to travel in this horizontal. Uh, medial to lateral imaging plane. A young girl who was in a major automobile accident, uh, this was about three days after her initial injury. We can see this huge gap in the right lobe of the liver. The only thing that prevented her from dying was it didn't extend into the inferior vena cava. If it did, she would have probably bled out. And we can also see uh, a large subcapsular hematoma that's which prevented her from, from uh, extending beyond the capsule uh, and, and bleeding out. But it, one of the largest uh, bleeds that I think I've ever seen and, and lacerations. Now, on occasion, you can have a significant intrahepatic uh, hemorrhage with extension to the uh, capsule, and you won't have hemoperitoneum because in the liver, this, this area of the liver is called the bare area, and the bare area communicates with the perinephric space, not the peritoneal cavity. So 
In this particular case, you may have no hemoperitoneum whatsoever and yet have a significant injury to the right lobe of the liver. Um, this, if you scan lower, you'll see infiltration of the perirenal uh, f fat, uh, which it does contigu is contiguous with, but in this, this case, a large parenchymal injury. Uh, another case, um, this is before the advent of uh, abdominal CT, maybe 20 years, well, actually more than 20 years ago. patient presented with a right upper quadrant pulsatile mass, and uh, we see a large uh, interparenchymal hematoma, and this turned out to be a large AV fistula. Pancreatic injuries are very significant, and they can lead to death. Uh, the mechanism of injury is usually a steering wheel, and you may see a significant vector force, especially through the uh, uh, body of the pancreas. This patient with chronic pancreatitis had an injury uh, about a year earlier, and we can see a calculus uh, at the site of her previous partial transection and led to significant long-standing intra-abdominal pain due to chronic pancreatitis from, from the laceration. Now, does ultrasound have a role? And I just like to bring this up very quickly. There have been two major studies, both from the University of California at San Diego by Serlin, where they evaluated 4,000 patients. Uh, when they found a positive ultrasound, that is, when they found fluid, CT or surgery was indicated, depending on if the patient was stable or not. However, what is the clinical value of a negative ultrasound? Well, they had, as I say, 4,000 patients. 3,679 had a negative ultrasound. 13% uh, of those were, had high risk because of fractures of the lower ribs, lumbar spine, pelvis, or had hematuria. And they concluded that at institutions where you're going to take the patient in and observe them for a day, the negative ultrasound exam and a negative clinical history um, will be satisfactory. However, at most hospitals, you're not going to admit most of these patients for the day, and therefore a negative ultrasound and a negative clinical exam uh, is not enough, and you do need a CT. So in, in conclusion, I'm going to wrap up with, first of all, delayed splenic rupture is a very important thing to worry about. So that's, that's uh, even with m relatively minor splenic injury on CT. You've got to watch for the hypoperfusion complex in children uh, and, uh, and adults, and uh, these patients usually belong uh, in intensive care or in the ICU and certainly not, uh, or in the surgery suite or, and not on the CT scan. And clinical history is important, and you, must, you may be the first one to recognize domestic violence and child abuse. Thank you very much. I'm excited to talk about GU radiology today. Um, I think GU radiology is part of our lives, and as we start scanning everybody with 16 and 32 and 64 slices, we're going to find more and more little things that we're going to end up following and dealing. So I think GU radiology is uh, here to stay, and hopefully uh, we'll all do a good job at it. The first 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about the upper system concentrating on the kidneys. The second 45 minutes is going to be concentrating on the upper collecting system and bladder. And then the last half hour, if you can possibly stand it, I'm going to show uh, some unknown cases. So for the first 45 minutes, the objectives are to review the Bosniak classification of cystic renal masses. There have been a couple recent articles in the literature talking about the 2F lesions, talking about biopsying 2F lesions. Um, I don't know how most of you felt about those articles, but I think some of them left me a little bit confused. Uh, fortunately, I was at the SUR meeting a couple weeks ago, and I still feel comfortable that the information I'm going to provide with to you today is uh, accurate and people like David Hartman and Peter Choiki uh, stand behind the information that I'm going to present today. Then I'm going to be talking about some of the most common solid renal tumors and briefly touch on some inflammatory processes. I've alluded to the fact that, that CT has really proven to be an excellent way to image the, the, the urinary system. Certainly with multi-detector CT, it's really 
an optimal modality for looking at solid masses and cystic masses. We could scan very quickly to minimize uh, misregistration that's associated with patient breathing. We can reconstruct images so that we center our slice on a lesion so that we minimize any volume averaging effect and minimize the chance of pseudo-enhancement. The Bosniak classification, I'll touch upon the critical features that we look for on pre- and post-contrast CT imaging. And certainly for surgical planning, to be able to clearly see the relationships on reconstructed images, the source images of the various uh, anatomic structures can be very helpful to the surgeons. And it's also important to keep in mind that up to 22% of patients with a primary renal cell will have a second tumor in the kidney. So it's really important that we look for those because that can certainly change patient management. Okay, this is the protocol that we've been using lately for renal tumors. Uh, as well as patients with painless hematuria. Probably one of the hottest topics at the SUR this year was CT urography, where people are looking at ways to really look at the, the collecting systems as carefully as possible. And I can tell you that it's very likely that within the next couple years, we'll have data that will support that there's really no more indications for doing IVPs. Uh, some of the work that's being done, uh, the thin collimation, that 16 slice and 32 slice, uh, and the type of reformatted images we can create are, are really uh, heading towards a, a world without IVP, which, I, which I'm fine with. Um, I think it's important to keep your technique uh, constant so that you can optimally compare one phase to the next. Uh, we have a PAC system that allows us to look at 2.5 millimeter images. Uh, obviously, if you don't have a PAX, uh, that's a whole lot of images to look at. But I, I think that most of us, if we don't have PAX, uh, will have it shortly. Excretory phase, we wait till four minutes, and um, that seems to be sufficient to distend most of the ureters. Okay, let's talk about the Bosniak classification. Bosniak 1, these are simple cysts. They essentially have no chance of being malignant. These are your classic fluid attenuation lesions, no enhancement, sharp margins, smooth, thin, or imperceptible walls. This you wouldn't call a Bosniak lesion because Bosniak uh, classification really should be based on CT, but this is a simple cyst, completely anechoic, no perceptible wall, posterior acoustic enhancement. Here's a simple cyst in this kidney here. Again, no perceptible wall. There was no enhancement between pre and post contrast. I think most people, when we talk about enhancement, I think most people feel that 10 Hounsfield unit is a reasonable number. Some people may stretch it to 15 Hounsfield units, especially if you're dealing with a smaller lesion where you're more worried about volume averaging effects. But on a routine basis, I think 10 Hounsfield units for a lesion that's a centimeter or bigger is probably reasonable. Okay, Bosniak II lesions. These are sometimes referred to as minimally complicated cysts. If you look at the literature, Approximately 3 to 5% of these lesions may be malignant. We don't follow them, and most people don't follow them. They're willing to accept that very, very low risk of malignancy and not recommend follow-up. These are lesions that have maybe one or two septations that are very thin, less than 2 millimeters, some fine calcifications either within the wall or within septa, no enhancement. And then Bosniak, not in his original paper, but in later papers, divided his hyperdense lesions into two categories. The hyperdense cysts that were type 2 were less than 3 centimeters and had greater than 25% of their outer wall extending outside the kidney. So you could get a look at that wall to see if it was regular or irregular. Was it paper thin or was it thick? And then again, no enhancement is a critical feature for these lesions. This is a uh, Bosniak II lesion. There is a very thin calcified septation here on the pre-contrast images. It maintains its appearance on the post-contrast. And 
neither of these components enhance. So this can be called a Bosniak II lesion, does not need to be further evaluated. This lesion is hyperdense, more than 25% extends outside the wall, and it doesn't enhance greater than 10 Helmsfield units. This is a Bosniak II hyperdense cyst. Bosniak III lesions. These are the 50-50 lesions. Half of these lesions will end up being malignant, half of them will be benign. So if I'm dealing with an internist or a urologist who maybe doesn't seem as experienced as I would like, I might remind them to tell their patient that this is a Bosniak III lesion. And if you take this patient to the operating room, which you should, there's a 50% chance that you're going to cut out something that's benign. And I think it's important that patients understand that so that after the fact they're not upset that they had this major surgery for something that was benign. These are lesions that have thicker septa, so greater than two millimeters. These include multiloculated lesions, three or more septations. Now, I know the Bosniak paper that came out reason, recently was describing some lesions that had nine or more septations and calling them 2F. The people I talked to, most of the people I talked to at the SUR really felt that if you had a multiloculated mass, it should be a surgical lesion. Irregular or thicker calcifications, those Bosniak II hyperdense lesions that do not meet the criteria, so greater than three centimeters or if less than 25% extended outside the wall. And then minimal septal enhancement. I think if you see septal enhancement, most people would agree that that's a concerning finding. Although, again, I will note that the Bosniak paper did suggest that you could have paper-thin septa that were enhancing that he wasn't particularly concerned about. But my feeling is that that's not really the consensus at this point. And I certainly encourage all of you to read those articles and, and judge for yourself and based on your experience. So here's a 72-year-old, and we see on this three-phase study that there is a multiloculated lesion, there is septal enhancement. This is not a cluster assist. This is a solitary lesion with multiple septations. This was called a Bosniak III lesion, and this was a cystic renal cell carcinoma. This is a different patient who started with an IVP, and you can see that there is a mass protruding into the renal pelvis, displacing the collecting system. Here is a cystic lesion with multiple septa. It certainly has a characteristic uh, appearance for a multiloculated cystic nephroma, but it's certainly not pathognomonic. This was resected, and this happened to be a multiloculated cystic nephroma. It was originally thought that these were all benign lesions, uh, these multiloculated cystic nephroma, but it actually turns out that there is a very small percent where the pathology will actually be uh, malignant. Bosniak IV lesions. Greater than 95% chance that these are malignant when you call something a Bosniak IV. Remember, these are cystic lesions. These are not solid lesions, but they're cystic lesions that have solid components. So this was a patient who had right flank pain in hematuria. We see a stone here. I hope those of you that are reading, screening CTs without IV or oral contrast, um, you know, this is the stuff that, that troubles me to a certain extent when we try to reassure someone because this measures as a simple cystic fluid. Uh, clearly when we give contrast, we see an enhancing septum, and we also see a nodule on that septation. This is a Bosniak IV lesion. This has a solid nodule that's enhancing, and this was resected and was a cystic renal cell carcinoma. Just to, to, to demonstrate and emphasize the importance of thin collimation, this was a patient who had, um, I think this patient had vague right upper quadrant pain. And this was an incidental finding in the left kidney. This was done with five millimeter collimation as most of our routine scanning of the upper abdomen is done. I think probably, can I have a show of hands of how many people, if they just had this one image, would call this a too small to characterize low density lesion in the left kidney? 
I mean, that's what I would call it. I might even go as far as to say this is probably a tiny cyst just to be even, you know, an extra step of reassurance because we see these every day. But it's really this image that, that's concerning because within the confines of that mass that one visualizes here, there's increased density. So if you see that, it should raise concern and, you know, bring the patient back. We certainly scan patients for reasons sometimes that are questionable, uh, but in this case, doing the 2.5 millimeter collimation made it very clear that this was, this was not a simple cyst, and this, this was actually a, a lesion that had a cystic component and a solid component, and therefore this is best classified as a Bosniak 4 7 millimeter lesion. I don't want to go into a debate about whether or not we should be resecting 7 millimeter renal cell carcinomas. Uh, that would take days, perhaps, but uh, this was the intraoperative ultrasound, uh, which I think nicely demonstrates the solid and the cystic component, and again, this was a small renal cell carcinoma. Okay, so what is this 2F category? Uh, what does the F stand for? Does it stand for follow-up? Does it stand for failure? Um, that's debatable. I think what's important, and one of the challenges, I think, when someone writes a paper saying what the ultimate pathology was on, on 2F lesions, I, I think if you took a, a 1,000 CT renal masses, cystic renal masses, I would guess that each of us would put a different number of those cases into the 2F category. Uh, there's something very personal, I think, about the 2F category. Um, so I think the, the data that comes from looking at one individual's 2F cases may vary uh, because I think we just use, people use it differently. Um, David Hartman, I think, made an important point in that in terms of what's a reasonable follow-up, he said that, you know, depending on how small the lesion is, that is reflected in his follow-up. So if he calls something a 2F and it's six millimeters, he may wait nine months or a year, uh, which he might not wait that long if it was a two centimeter 2F lesion. And I think that makes sense. And I think, um, I think a logical approach and a consistent approach is, is important. These are just lesions that that the individual doesn't feel comfortable calling a two or a three. Um, and let me show you an example. This is an MR. Patient clearly has a hemorrhagic lesion. This is a T1 uh, sequence here. Uh, we weren't convinced that it was enhancing. Uh, question that always gets asked, well, how do you judge something as enhancing on MR? Um, and at the SUR, there did seem to be some agreement, and there is some literature out there that suggests that the Hounsfield, uh, not the Hounsfield unit, the signal intensity uh, measurement goes up 15%, that that's probably significant and reflective in enhancement. So 15%. So if this was 100 signal intensity units and this was 120, that would be a 20% increase, and it would probably be reasonable to say that that was enhancing. Why do I need to call, if, if, I'm, if I don't have a 2F category, I have to call this a three, right? Because it's hyper dense or hyper intense, and it doesn't, I don't have more than 25% that extends outside the wall. So I really can't call it a two if I believe in the system and I use the system, and I do, which would force me to call it a three, but there's nothing about it that worries me. So I call this a 2F, and it's been stable for about a year. This is that lesion I showed you before that I called it, I called it a two. Well, the problem was that this was actually 3.3 centimeters. So again, because it doesn't meet all the criteria for being called a Bosniak II hyperdense, I would need to call it a three. But again, everything about it looks benign. There's really no perceptible wall. There was no enhancement. So I chose to call this a 2F, and this has been stable for over two years. Again, the importance of thin collimation, high resolution. This was, a, this was an incidental finding. A thick enhancing septation was the concern on this, on this uh, cystic area here. We brought the patient back, did a dedicated study, and with our thin collimation, we saw that that septation was actually a renal arterial branch, 
that on the coronal reef formats is shown to be running between a cortical cyst and a parapelvic cyst. So sometimes the reconstructions, the thinner collimation can, can really help clarify the issue and avoid making Bosniak classification errors. I'm going to talk about a few entities that are associated with multiple cysts. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful research that's being done right now uh, uh, at the NIH in particular where they're looking at uh, genetic um, gene mutations that are associated with uh, some of these entities and um, it, it's really exciting work. Um, let's start with autosomal dominant polycystic ki uh, kidney disease. This is something that we all see fairly frequently. It's uh, characterized by bilateral renal enlargement. There are numerous cysts of variable sizes that tend to be randomly scattered throughout the kidney. The cysts may involve the liver, the pancreas, the spleen. Uh, we certainly are all familiar with the fact that there's an increased risk of cerebral aneurysms in these patients. These patients tend to progress to end stage renal disease. So here's a very typical appearance multiple cysts. The normal cortex is being essentially replaced. These are big kidneys. Here's another example with splenic, uh, I'm sorry, pancreatic liver and multiple renal cysts. Tuber sclerosis. This is also a heritable. Uh, neurocutaneous uh, syndrome. It's associated with mental retardation, renal angiomyolipomas that are often bilateral, central nervous system hamartomas, and there can be pulmonary manifestations that are identical to LAM. This is a patient with tuberous sclerosis, bilateral enlarged kidneys on this coronal reconstructed image, multiple cysts. And here on CT and uh, chest CT in the same patient, we see subependable nodules uh, as well as pulmonary manifestations consistent with LAM. This is another patient with tuberous sclerosis, multiple small renal cysts, as well as scattered small fatty angiomyolipomas. Von Hippel-Lindau is also a uh, a, a genetic disease uh, that's manifested by cerebral hemangioblastomas and retinal angiomas. There's uh, an increased incidence of bilateral renal cell carcinomas, renal cysts, pheochromocytoma, and various pancreatic tumors. This is a patient who would have been following for years who had von Hippel-Lindau, had some uh, cystic and solid pancreatic masses, had had a partial nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma, had a couple stable cysts in the right kidney, and then this was a slightly hyperdense lesion in the right kidney that was a little bit concerning. And, and this is what the lesion looked like a year later. So now clearly this is enlarging, there's a solid component, and uh, this is a carcinoma. And these people just form renal cell carcinomas. Uh, Peter Choiki made an interesting point. He says that he knows these people, they make tumors, and so they basically follow these people on an annual basis. And they may shorten the follow-up interval if... Uh, as long as the tumor, if the tumor is under three centimeters, but once the, cent the tumor approaches three centimeters or is greater than three centimeters, at that point they generally resect them. So uh, they tend to be, these, these folks tend to get slow growing tumors. Certainly that isn't how you'd want to manage someone who doesn't have von Hippel Lindau, but these people are a unique class of patients. Acquired renal cystic disease, this is what we see in patients who have been on hemodialysis, usually for five or more years. Uh, these are multiple small cysts. They're in small kidneys. They tend to not uh, grossly distort the outer contour, and these folks are at increased risk of renal cell carcinoma. And here's a typical appearance of a patient with acquired renal cystic disease. Localized cystic disease uh, is a term that just showed up relatively recently in the radiology literature. Um, the reason it, I think it was important to be in the literature is because it can be a mimicker of renal cell carcinoma, uh, 
particularly multi, multi-cystic loculated. The important thing in this entity and, and the important thing in distinguishing this from renal cell uh, carcinoma that's cystic is that this tends to be a cluster of cysts. This is not a single cystic mass with septations. Uh, although it can look that way because you can have parenchyma that gets trapped between the cysts. The other unique feature about this localized cystic disease is that often it's just one portion of one kidney that shows a cluster of cysts, and often the other kidney won't have any cysts or one or two small cysts. So it's a, it's a localized cystic process. Okay, moving on to solid renal masses. I think it's important to keep in mind that when you see a solid renal mass, you try to determine if it's growing like a ball or is it an infiltrative tumor. And that will help form a a reasonable differential diagnosis for what that tumor is likely to be. Uh, David Hartman, for years, has been talking about beans and balls, and I think this is just a very effective way to think about solid renal tumors. Renal cell carcinoma is certainly the most common solid tumor that we see. Uh, A certain percent of them will be calcified. CT is very accurate in in diagnosis. Uh, The staging I've listed here, and it's also in your handout. So keep in mind, renal cell carcinoma are your solid masses until proven otherwise, and your Bosniak 3 and 4 Cystic lesions also need to be considered renal cell carcinoma till proven otherwise. This is a seven-year-old, and this is a renal transplant. Now, when we saw this, we really wanted to think that this was lymphoproliferative disease. This is something unusual, maybe something infectious. Here's the CT cutting through it. But this is a renal cell carcinoma. And then we thought about it. This was a seven-year-old who had a 65-year-old's kidney. So keep in mind that sometimes transplants bring disease with them. And like I I always like to say, uh, never mind. I was going to say you're only as young as your oldest organ. But uh, when looking at masses on ultrasound, it's very helpful to use your Doppler. Uh, Clearly, we see lobulations of the kidneys all the time. But if you can put on the color Doppler and convince yourself that the vasculature of that contour abnormality is different from the adjacent cortex, you can be certain that you're dealing with a solid mass. Now, if you don't see any color flow at all, then it may be reasonable to get other cross-sectional imaging because sometimes these tumors are quite hypovascular. This was a patient who had a relatively small renal cell carcinoma, but it was quite aggressive in how it grew into the renal vein, up the cava, and into the right atrium. Here's a case we had recently of a patient who came in with shortness of breath. Pulmonary embolus CT was ordered, and you can see that there are bilateral pulmonary emboli, and there was an incidental renal cell carcinoma, as well as what was presumed to be tumor thrombus in the cava. We did an MRI. This is a FISP image, which shows that there's thrombus within the renal vein as well as in the cava. And giving gadolinium nicely helped distinguish what was bland thrombus from what was tumor thrombus. When this patient went to surgery, they ended up biopsying one of the pulmonary arteries, and it turned out that the embolic material was actually renal cell carcinoma that had broken off and traveled into the pulmonary arteries. Metastatic disease, I won't spend much time here, but certainly we're always looking for uh, nodal metastases, liver metastases that can be quite subtle, bone lesions, pulmonary nodules. Okay, moving on to angiomyolipomas. These are benign hamartomas. Most of them will end up being isolated. 90% will contain fat. 10% won't, and that's something to keep in mind. And fat within a renal mass is still considered diagnostic of an angiomyolipoma, and I'll discuss that point uh, a little bit later. When these things get bigger, one should consider resecting them because as they get bigger, there's an increased risk of hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage can be quite serious. And another point is that ultrasound cannot reliably differentiate or distinguish an AML from a renal cell. Typical CT appearance of an angiomyolipoma, 
on all phases, you can see that there are large areas of fat density. There's enhancement, as one would expect. This is an AML. Here's an AML on ultrasound. Can I be absolutely certain this isn't a renal cell? No. Notice there, there is, though, some sound attenuation, which we know fat tends to do, but CT confirmed that this was fat, a small angiomyelopoma. This is a patient who did not have tuberous sclerosis but did have bilateral angiomyelopomas. She presented into the emergency room with right flank pain. She had acute hemorrhage from one of the large AMLs on the right. This is a patient that presented with hematuria. This patient had a CT, had an MRI. One of my colleagues and I, we, we went back and forth. We, we had a little side bet. Was this going to be a renal cell or was this going to be a transitional cell carcinoma? Well, we were both wrong. This turned out to be an AML that did not have any fat within it. This is, this is something that one will expect on 10% of the patients who end up having AMLs that they will end up having to go to surgery because you cannot distinguish them from renal cell carcinoma. This was a patient. These are pre-contrast and post-contrast. I hope you can all see that this lesion has fat within it. So one would like to call it a angiomyolipoma, but what's the problem? The problem is that there's also calcification and the consensus or word on the street is, and I believe it, is that intratumoral calcification should be viewed as a feature of carcinoma irrespective of the presence of intratumoral fat. The likelihood that a renal cell will produce fat and calcium is much, 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 much greater than the likelihood of an AML having calcification within it. Okay? And there's speculation as to why renal cell carcinomas can produce fat and calcium. Some people talk about this osseous metaplasia. There's a lot of different theories, but, but keep in mind, if you have a lesion that has fat and calcium, you have to be concerned that it's a renal cell carcinoma. Now, this is the stuff that shows up in case reports in the literature, and this is the stuff that scares me as much as I'm sure it scares you. This is a renal cell carcinoma that has macroscopic big areas of fat within it without calcification. This is a case report. There are a few case reports out there. I would still argue that the right practice is to call this an AML. And, and, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where it's unfortunate that, that this turned out to be a renal cell. But conventional wisdom is, especially if you see big, large areas, you call them AML. And, and I think that's just the conventional wisdom. You know, we, the, we can't expect to be 100%, but to, for every patient that has a, an AML that we'd end up following for five or six years, it just doesn't make sense. Metastases. These tend to be multiple bilateral lesions. We tend to know that the patient has a primary. Uh, keep in mind that renal cell can be multifocal. This is a patient who had lung cancer. These were new renal masses. The patient was put on chemo for their lung cancer. These got smaller. This is a patient with bilateral solid renal masses. These are bilateral renal cell carcinomas. Oncocytomas, these are solid tumors. They arise from the proximal convoluted tubules. There are certainly suggestive features, but these are not diagnostic. Central stellate scar, again, suggestive, but not diagnostic. These are surgical lesions. Here's a classic appearance of an oncocytoma. This patient happens to have bilateral oncocytomas. Beautiful central stellate scar, another one here. Again, the appearance is suggestive, but this is a surgical lesion. For every case I have like this, I've got about five cases that look like this. Central stellate scar, beautiful appearance for oncocytoma. This is a renal cell carcinoma. Okay, so just to emphasize, it may be suggestive, but these are surgical lesions. 
lymphoma, I refer to these as the do-anything tumors. They can give you infiltrative tumors. They can give you solitary lesions. They can give you multiple lesions. They can do pretty much whatever they want, but there's usually other findings that suggest a diagnosis, usually extensive retroperitoneal adenopathy. And lymphoma tends to be hypoechoic on ultrasound. So here's a typical non-Hodgkin's lymphoma involving the kidneys. You have more focal ill-defined areas here and here. Then you have this kind of surrounding infiltrative tumor uh, in the retroperitoneum. Here you have more discrete bilateral renal masses, but there's also retroperitoneal adenopathy. There was adenopathy in the chest. This is another case of lymphoma. Typical appearance on ultrasound, hypoechoic areas. Some of these are fairly subtle. I've seen about five cases that look exactly like this, and every single one of them was an HIV patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Diffuse uh, replacement of the normal architecture with, with lymphomatous uh, infiltration. This is an HIV positive patient, has a right renal mass, has extensive adenopathy. Patient had some nodes in the axillary regions that were biopsied. Patient had a diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Can we be certain this is lymphoma? No. What do we do? We say, well, treat the patient. We'll follow them up and see what happens. Well, the patient comes back, has an MR. All the adenopathy is gone. The renal tumor is bigger. This is a renal cell carcinoma. Moving on to the bean lesions. These are those that grow through the process of infiltration. I've listed the major ones here. We might strongly suggest invasive transitional cell carcinoma if we see irregularity or amputation of the collecting system. These are usually hypovascular tumors relative to renal cell carcinomas. This is a case we've, we saw in the last year. You've got an infiltrative tumor here. It does not distort the contour. And as you follow that tumor centrally, you can see that there's thickening and tumor extension into the renal pelvis. There's also regional adenopathy. This is a transitional cell carcinoma. Here's a coronal reformat, I think, which nicely demonstrates the contrast of pacified collecting system and, and shows how it's very sharply truncated where the tumor has infiltrated the parenchyma as well as extended into the collecting system. If one shot a retrograde, this is a different patient with transitional cell, but this is what you might expect to see. But this is certainly not pathognomonic, and for all the residents in the audience, if you see a retrograde or an IVP that looks like this, you want to think about transitional cell, but you also want to think about tuberculosis. Renal medullary carcinoma, these are very aggressive tumors. They're in young patients that have sickle cell trait. These patients generally are metastatic at presentation and do very poorly. Most are dead within a year, if not sooner. This was a, a young African-American boy that was seen at a community hospital. Uh, he had a CT and had low-grade fevers. At first, when he was evaluated, they thought that perhaps he had a severe pyelonephritis. He didn't respond well to antibiotics. Um, it, it really didn't matter. At that time, he was already metastatic. There's some small regional lymph nodes, but this is medullary carcinoma. Here it is on the excretory phase. So something to think about when you see a central infiltrative type tumor, um, you know, maybe pick up the phone if it's a young person and say, does this patient happen to be sickle, have sickle cell trait? Infiltrative uh, renal cell, this is uncommon, uncommon, but it can mimic a urothelial tumor. Um, it's a little bit of a stretch to call this an infiltrative type tumor. It's uh, quite large, but uh, this is an MRI coronal post gadolinium and the MRA just showing how vascular this tumor is. And this is a renal cell carcinoma. Okay. I'll probably spend the next 10 minutes just briefly going over some of these major inflammatory processes. Some of these slides are a little bit busy, but everything's in your handout, so. Uh, I'm just going to try to emphasize the highlights here. 
acute pyelonephritis. This is certainly a, a clinical diagnosis. The radiologic features are generally nonspecific, but certainly when we see a combination of them and we get some history, um, we can usually, you know, solidify the diagnosis. So here's a typical appearance. You've got poor enhancement, hypodensity, a little bit of irregularity and stranding of the fat. Very typical for focal pyelonephritis. I show this case uh, because currently at Northwestern, we, when we have patients that uh, come through the emergency room to evaluate for kidney stones, if, if the study is completely normal, uh, we generally encourage the, the emergency room to let us inject them with contrast because um, on occasion such as this, um, this diagnosis could not have been made without the IV contrast. And this was a, a young male who had some right flank pain, did not have any stone disease. This CT was really normal, uh, but when we gave contrast, we saw that he actually did have focal pyelonephritis. Uh, one of my colleagues is actually looking at our complete experience with uh, how many findings do we actually pick up when we give people contrast, and uh, I anticipate that he'll submit something for publication in the next few months because... Uh, you know, is it worth it to give everybody who's got a normal stone study IV contrast? I think that's a tough question that hopefully he can help answer. This is the flip-flop enhancement that one can see with pyelonephritis. On the earlier phase, you have relative hypodensity that becomes relatively hyperdense on a later delayed image. This is an ultrasound case of pyelonephritis, a little bit unusual in that the area of focal pyelonephritis is actually hyperechoic. Um, and what sometimes the residents find counterintuitive is that with color Doppler, the area of focal infection is actually hypoperfused relative to the rest of the cortex. And here's the CT on that same patient. Abscesses. The most important thing to keep in mind is that the imaging features of an abscess are really going to depend on the age of the abscess, how much liquefaction has taken place. So that's, that's certainly something important to keep in mind because their, their imaging features will evolve. But in most cases, when there is a renal abscess, there will usually be findings of pyelonephritis elsewhere in the kidneys. So in this case, this is very suggestive of pyelonephritis involving the anterior cortex of the lower pole, so that when you see this area of relative hypodensity and then relative or close to fluid density here, one can feel confident that this is a patient with multifocal pyelonephritis and a small renal abscess. This was a more unusual case. This, this young man came through the emergency room, and he had some low-grade fevers and a little bit of pain on the right side. Somehow, the first study he ended up getting was ultrasound. Um, and I, I, I like this case because I think it, it's an opportunity to emphasize there's a difference between anechoic and very hypoechoic. And it may be difficult to appreciate, but this is hypoechoic. This is not ana this is not anechoic, and, and that's important because it, it really requires further evaluation. This is not a simple parapelvic cyst, um, and so he went to CT without delay. And what we see is a nice band of edema around this. Uh, this area here, and this was subsequently stuck by our interventional radiologist and was a three and a half centimeter renal abscess. XGP, this is a complication of chronic infection, uh, usually in the setting of obstruction, either by a stone stricture or even a tumor. Again, the appearance of XGP will, will somewhat depend on what stage you catch the disease process. It most often is a diffuse process, but it can be focal and can mimic a tumor. This is a case one of my colleagues uh, had given me, and it's a, a nice uh, correlation between CT imaging and ultrasound imaging, where we can see some dilated calyces here, and then we see this pus-filled dilated uh, portion of the collecting system and a large central staghorn calculus uh, as the cause of obstruction. 
this was a, a woman in her 40s who actually had fevers of unknown origin, and this CT was performed, and the right kidney looked relatively normal. The lower pole, the left kidney looked normal, but this complicated cystic appearance of the upper pole, the left kidney, was concerning for a neoplasm. So her left kidney was resected, and this turned out to be focal XGP. Just a few slides on tuberculosis. Um, it's still out there. Uh, I'm going to show you a case that I saw about uh, four or five months ago of someone who had renal tuberculosis. Um, it's really, in the early stage, papillary necrosis is, is kind of the hallmark feature. Um, as you get coalescence of the inflammatory process, uh, these areas tend to erode into the collecting system so that you get these areas of cavitation that come off the central collecting system um, and you get these parenchymal cavities. Uh, in the end stage of tuberculosis, we see calcification, non-functioning kidney, so-called autonephrectomy. And, and certainly TB can involve the ureters. It can involve the bladder as well. This was a patient I alluded to. She was in here recently, and she had the diagnosis of tuberculosis. She was having some hematuria, and we see abnormality in this coalescence of this abnormality within the region of the papilla. And then over time, we see the papilla sloughing and, and the irregularity that results from the papillary necrosis. This is an old case from... Uh, Dr. Earl Noodleman at Northwestern. This is a retrograde study showing extensive abnormal cal uh, cavitation in a patient with advanced tuberculosis. This is another case. This is a retrograde. There was this area of lobulation in the upper pole, and angio showed that this area was very hypovascular. This was resected, and this was a tuberculoma. Again, here on this retrograde, we see the amputation of the upper collecting system. And then the final slide is this is an autonephrectomy. This is a non-contrast study. This is just a plain radiograph. This is all calcification of this kidney and extensive calcification of the ureter. The question that was asked was uh, regarding patients who frequently come through the emergency room, and the question is evaluate for stones, and we see these exophetic cysts, and yet you've got a stone in the right ureter, you can explain their symptoms, and then you've got a cyst in the left kidney that when you put a Hounsfield unit measurement on there, uh, there's nothing about it that seems concerning. Um, you know, I can tell you what we do. I mean, what I do, I'll say there is a two centimeter low density lesion in the left kidney. It is cystic, but I'm not able to fully characterize it on this study. Um, you know, it's just, I, I think that's all you can say. I mean, if I, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it is a cyst. It is a cyst, but you can't say it isn't the cystic renal cell. I mean, that's the problem that you have on a non contrast study. So um, I think it's just one of those things where you have to kind of get comfortable with it. And again, I think a lot of what we do is about expectations. Um, you know, and I think it's important that we educate the public that when you do a screening CT without GI or IV contrast, you are going to miss some cystic renal cell carcinomas. And whether or not they understand that and what the implication is, I, I think that's the challenge that we have and, and the physicians that order these studies or the patients that go and get the scans themselves. One can think of the, the, the lower urinary system as, you know, one, one pa a highway that's just lined by transitional epithelium and, and consider it as one organ of sorts. But I, I think it makes sense to break up the upper system from the lower uh, collecting system. And when one then tries to organize that, I find it helpful to think of a few differential diagnoses, um, although the, the entities which in, within each of these are certainly not mutually exclusive. So there is a certain amount of redundancy in this lecture, but uh, hopefully that'll be a positive rather than a negative. 
So when we talk about dilatation of the pelvic haloceal system, uh, I tend to be a stickler for terminology. I, I tend to call things that I think are a blockage, a mechanical obstruction. I like to call those hydronephrosis. But if I'm not certain, and if there might be reflux, I'll tend to call it pelvic haloectasis. But there's, I think, some debate, and one can debate that, but uh, ultimately one needs to feel comfortable with the language that they use to communicate. Uh, but when we talk about obstructions, we can have mechanical obstructions due to tumors or stones, or we can have functional obstructions. And when we talk about the functional obstructions, the two main entities that come to mind are really the one, which is UPJs, because I, I, I've never seen a de novo case of primary mega ureter. Um, these are what we talk about. But certainly reflux, if a patient's had a, a brisk diuresis, that can cause a transient pelvic haloectasis. And I'll briefly show you an example of this. CT has clearly established itself as the, the gold standard for imaging kidney stones. Um, we don't need to use contrast. We can see the number of stones, where the stones are. We can find diseases that are mimicking renal colic. It's an easy study to do. We do these all the time. Uh, this was a patient right flank pain. It's quite apparent there's uh, dilatation of the right renal pelvis. The kidney is enlarged. It's edematous. And then there's the obstructing stone. Um, our resident happened to give IV contrast. Uh, and you can see the physiologic abnormalities that are associated with a acute mechanical obstruction. You have a delay in the enhancement and delay in excretion when compared to the left kidney. On an IVP, we see that there is a filling defect here and there's d slight dilatation above that. On the scout, that's a stone. Here's a patient who had lithotripsy on the left side. You can see that there's already excretion on the right. There's no excretion on the left. Multiple stones lining up in the distal left ureter. This is Steinstrasen status post lithotripsy of a large stone that had been in the left renal pelvis. This is a different case. Whereas on the prior study, when you have a stone, the ureter distal to the stone or beyond the stone will often spasm. In patients with transitional cell carcinoma, there's usually focal or often focal dilatation. This is either called the goblet sign or the Bergman sign, and it's certainly suggestive. And in this case, there wasn't a stone on the scout. So if you have a filling defect, and you don't have a calcification, you have to be concerned about a transitional cell. This patient had a CT, pre-contrast, post-contrast, here and here, there's an enhancing mass. This is a transitional cell. Sometimes the hydronephrosis is not related to a process within the ureter, but a, but a process within the bladder. This is a giant transitional cell of the bladder. Sometimes the obstruction is due to a clip. This patient had an emergent C-section. This left ureter got clipped. This is bilateral dilatation, quite massive. This is a neurogenic bladder and dilatation above that. This is an example of primary mega ureter. This is a kind of a rare entity that's where you'll often see sharp tapering at the distal aspect of the ureter. Uh, and it's thought that this is a mechanical problem. There's, there's a reason why that distal aspect of the ureter doesn't peristalse normally. It's kind of comparable to a UPJ, except it's distal. The severity it can be quite variable. These patients may be completely asymptomatic, but in some cases where the functional abnormality is more severe, the hydronephrosis can become very extensive and can actually compromise the renal function. And in this case, this had been long standing such that it actually formed a stone within the dilated ureter. This was a patient came through the emergency room with some left sided pain. She said her symptoms were worse when she was drinking beer. At first, we really weren't impressed at all with the CT. There was, you know, really, you had to really use your imagination to, to, to find any caliectasis. There was a little bit of pelviectasis, and it seemed that there was maybe a crossing vessel 
which is of questionable significance. But because the history was so good, I had the resident get a delayed CT scout on the patient, and the, the appearance was really classic for a UPJ. So sometimes the axial images might not be impressive, but if there's a good story, um, a delayed scout like this turned out to be pretty helpful. Okay, is this a blockage or what is this? Well, this turns out to be, this is massive bilateral reflux in a patient who has a, a paralysis. So again, is it obstructed? Do you call it hydronephrosis? Uh, it's all semantics. This is the congenital uh, megacalus that I, I took from Davidson's book, the example. Uh, it's characterized by uh, caliactasis without pelviactasis, and there's often uh, more uh, calyces than is typically seen. Okay, filling defects. The list I show you when I discuss the bladder is going to look very similar to this. These are the type of filling defects that one gets associated with uh, transitional epithelium. You can have stones, you can have tumors, inflammatory processes, slough tissues, clots, fungal balls, foreign bodies, crossing vessels. This is the stone that got lithotripsy and resulted in the Steinhausen and the left-sided hydronephrosis earlier. This is not a tough diagnosis. This is a little bit tougher. You've got a small round filling defect. Fortunately, we had a good scout tomogram and we could see that there was a calcification. Again, this is a no-brainer on CT. Very easy to see this stone on ultrasound. Nice clean posterior shadowing. This is a coronal reformat and a stone protocol nicely demonstrating a stone in the mid ureter on that patient. This did not have a corresponding calcification on the scout image. This is actually a retrograde study showing a large lobulated mass in the renal pelvis. This is a transitional cell carcinoma till proven otherwise. This is a different patient. IVP shows uh, a filling defect within the central area of the left renal pelvis. Here's the mass pre-contrast, post-contrast, there's some peripheral calcification or stones. This mass enhances, this is an enhancing mass, this is transitional cell carcinoma. CT of appearance of transitional cell carcinoma can be variable. Uh, you may see, it may be as subtle as this. This is actually a transitional cell carcinoma causing this very subtle thickening so when we're doing these patients, and like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of push. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of work being done with CT urography. But we really have to be familiar with what the abnormalities are and how subtle they are. We have to be very careful that we use uh, high-quality technique. Uh, we use multiphasic technique uh, with a similar protocol that I mentioned. So this is one presentation. Uh, the tumors may be uh, little papillary projections, as in this case. And fortunately, a lot of them end up being masses, and these are the easier ones. Uh, here we have a large mass in the renal pelvis, and here we have a large mass in the ureter. Ultrasound is not the way to screen for transitional cells, I'm sure you all know, and if that arrow wasn't there, you'd probably all be squinting and wondering why I'm even showing you this slide. But uh, there was confirmed to be a transitional cell in this area, and uh, somebody else made the diagnosis, not myself. This is a lot easier. You've got a filling defect here on the pre-contrast MRI. Certainly, you can have a differential that includes blood clot. Um, it's really not a typical stone appearance on MR. Could be tumor, but once you give the gadolinium, this enhances. This is a solid transitional cell carcinoma. This is an example of pyelitis cystica and ureteritis cystica. These entities often occur together. You get these very tiny filling defects. Uh, this is thought to be associated with recurrent urinary tract infections. This is a, a picture from Davidson's book. Uh, this is actually an example of leukoplakia. 
Uh, how many people out in the audience have seen leukoplakia or malacoplakia? Yeah, just in the textbooks. And th the reality is if you see this, this should be called transitional cell until proven otherwise. If the pathologist shows it to be leukoplakia or malacoplakia, I think that's reasonable. And perhaps if a board examiner says, what else, then maybe you want to mention leukoplakia or malacoplakia. But uh, otherwise, stick with transitional cell in the real world. Um, this is... Uh, Papillary necrosis, certainly when papilla sloth, they can cause filling defects. Uh, a triangular appearance is, is certainly highly suggestive of slough papilla. And uh, this was a reasonable mnemonic that still serves me well, postcard. And this is just an example of a crossing vessel that one doesn't want to mistake for uh, uh, true pathology, and often when you take different projections of these patients on an IVP, you'll see that it doesn't persist. Although, again, this wouldn't be a problem on CT. Okay, the next differential is effacement of the pelvic calyceal system. There are a few new entities in here, uh, although we still see tumor infection. So everybody in the audience should be thinking invasive transitional cell versus tuberculosis as the cause of abnormality of this upper collecting system. This was a case of uh, transitional cell carcinoma involving the upper pole of this kidney. This is a patient with tuberculosis causing this abnormality of the upper collecting system. These are some of the uh, ugliest uh, renal pelvis I'd ever seen. Uh, extensive stranding, marked wall thickening. This is the right renal pelvis. This turned out to be a fungal infection that was involving the urinary tract. This is a, should be a common appearance to, to all of you that still do IVP, where you have this very uniform tapering of the unfundibula uh, centrally. Uh, the reasonable differential for this is multiple parapelvic cysts or renal sinus lipomatosis. Um, the latter entity is a proliferation of normal fat uh, in the renal sinus, and it results in this type of uniform infundibular narrowing without obstruction. Uh, in this case, it actually turned out to be uh, multiple uh, parapelvic cysts, as demonstrated on this ultrasound. And keep in mind, if you're doing ultrasound and you see this appearance, you should ask, you know, you should have in the back of your mind, could I be looking at multiple small parapelvic cysts rather than hydronephrosis? And the reality is this case that I showed you with these two images, this case actually started with the ultrasound, and it was an incidental bilateral hydronephrosis, and it's from a while ago, and to answer that question, they actually did an IVP, which uh, probably wouldn't happen today. Here's a case of a peripherally calcified renal artery aneurysm that's causing some uh, mass effect upon the upper collecting system on this IVP. Okay, I want everyone to take a minute to look at this IVP. Left side, I think everybody agrees looks reasonable. On the right side, how many think that there is one abnormality? How many think there are more than one abnormality? How many vote for one abnormality? Okay, that's not a trick question, I know it. All right, well, there's two abnormalities. There's mass effect on the upper portion of the collecting system here, and then there's clearly splaying here. I wouldn't bet on density whether or not one thing is solid and one is cystic, but this area does look a little bit less dense than this. But clearly there was an abnormality. The upper pole abnormality was from a large renal cell the mid to lower was a large cyst. Ureteral narrowing or stricture, tumor infection, inflammatory processes, metabolic processes, trauma. You've seen this case before. Again, keep in mind that when there's extrinsic mass effect on a ureter, there tends to be a, long tr a longer transition zone, um, whereas if it's intrinsic, you tend to see uh, a shorter transition zone and often overhanging edges. 
So this was, a, again, a transitional cell carcinoma. This is a patient who had an upper urinary tract blockage due to extrinsic mass effect by multiple metastases. These were hemangiopericytomas. This is another case from Davidson. This is active tuberculosis creating a beaded appearance of the ureter, multiple areas of stricturing throughout the ureter. This is a patient who was HIV positive. This is CMV ureteritis that was causing bilateral hydronephrosis. This is a coronal T2-weighted sequence showing upper dilatation. This is a transverse image. There's the right ureter, there's the left ureter grossly thickened, irregular margins. This is CMV. This is a case of retroperitoneal fibrosis. This is the result of proliferation of fibrous tissue, usually at the midline or periodic distribution. Um, it's often idiopathic, but it can be associated with certain drugs. It can be associated with radiation therapy, uh, aortitis. Certain tumors that are, have desmoplastic reaction can do it as well. And if you see it, keep in mind that metastatic adenopathy, lymphoma, or perianurismal fibrosis can mimic it in its imaging features. This is a patient that had a focal stricture, and when one looked back at their old IVP, there had actually been an obstructing stone at the site. So this is just a benign stricture causing mild dilatation and focal tapering of this right ureter. Extra calicele contrast. This patient had an IVP uh, presented with hematuria. On the delayed phase, we see excretion into both the collecting systems, and there was progressive filling here. This is a calicele diverticulum, and if you look closely, there's actually a stone within it, and that was presumed to be the source of this patient's hematuria. This is medullary sponge. This is characterized by abnormal dilatation of the collecting tubules and usually presents as multiple discrete collections of contrast in the renal pyramids. With contrast administration, there's often a characteristic paintbrush appearance, and these patients not infrequently will develop medullary nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis. This is uh, another patient with uh, medullary sponge in which we see extensive nephrocalcinosis on both plain radiograph as well as on CT. This is the third time I'm showing you that patient had the right ureteral stone where the kidney was uh, enlarged and there was a distal ureteral stone and then the resident gave contrast and there was delay in enhancement. Well, there was even an additional delay and we can see that there's some contrast leakage from the collecting system into the retroperitoneum. This is obviously a, a leakage that uh, is in communication with the renal collecting system. This was a patient who had had a uh, left partial nephrectomy for an AML that was complicated with a urinoma and required drainage. Ureteral outpouchings. This is a case I saw about a week ago. Uh, it's not as good as the case I used to show from Davidson's, but it's my own. and. Uh, there's a little pseudodiverticulum there and another one there and there. These are little one or one to four millimeter outpouchings that are due to hyperplastic transitional epithelium that invaginates into the lamina propria of the ureter. Uh, there is an association with urinary tract infections, obstructions, and uh, urolithiasis. This patient did have a focal low-grade stricture in this ureter, just above this level, and there's thought that these are associated with a slight increased risk of transitional cell carcinoma. This is a patient we saw within the last couple months. This woman had had a hysterectomy and a left oophorectomy. Uh, she presented with left-sided abdominal pain. Uh, we did a multiphasic study. Uh, it's probably easiest to start on the bottom images. This is the bladder and this is the vagina. On delayed images, we see that this is the normal ureter here and this is an abnormal tract extending from the ureter. 
Some of it actually spills out into the peritoneal cavity, but then this tract could be traced to the vagina. So she had actually had a post-surgical ureteral vaginal fistula. And here on these images, these coronal reformats, you can see the urine uh, spilling into the peritoneal cavity. And here I think you can nicely see the fistula. Deviations of the ureters. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next uh, two years I won't be showing these slides anymore because, it, because we won't be doing IVPs. Uh, hopefully it will only be for historical interest. Um, this is in your handout. And for the residents, when you see deviation of a ureter on an IVP, I mean, obviously, it's important to understand what the normal courses should be first before you're going to recognize an abnormal course. But then just think about all the pathology you see every day uh, on your abdominal and pelvic CTs and try to imagine what might be in that location to deviate the ureter one way or another. So it's actually fairly simple. And I'll just show you some unusual things uh, that can certainly be associated with deviating the ureters. This was a large retroperineal fluid attenuation mass, uh, and this turned out to be a lymphangioma. This was a patient who had surgery on the pancreas and just had developed a large uh, retroperineal hematoma with a hematocrit level seen here. I showed you this case earlier of retroperineal fibrosis, which certainly can be associated with deviation of the superior ureters medially. Pelvic ureters, typically the deviation is going to be medial, uh, and I'll show you some examples. This is a medial deviation just due to prominence of the psoas muscles in a healthy young male patient. But here's a, a deviation that was the result of a bladder diverticulum off to the right. Deviation of the left ureter medial due to large hematoma in the left hemipelvis with multiple pelvic fractures. Extensive adenopathy causing medial deviation. Internal iliac artery aneurysms causing medial deviation. Okay, so here's the, the, the quiz at the end of the uh, session regarding uh, ureteral deviation. So um, the right is normal. The left is being deviated medially at its superior aspect and is being deviated lateral at its inferior aspect. It's a lot easier on CT where you see that the medial deviation is due to the colon and the lateral deviation distally is due to this large fibroid uterus. Uh, moving on to the urinary bladder. We've seen all these entities before, haven't we? Stones, fungal ball, clot, tissue, foreign bodies. Here's a case of a patient who came in with hematuria, had an IVP, didn't see these stones prospectively didn't see them at all, but once we got a little bit of contrast excretion in that bladder, all of a sudden we saw those filling defects, and then we were able to look back on our scout and say, you know, there are a couple big stones there. This patient obviously is a stone former because he has a great big prostate. This is a lot easier, isn't it? This was a patient who had right flank pain. There were no stones in the ureter. There, was, there wasn't even dilatation, but there was the little stones. Um, I think that would be awfully tough to see on an IVP. Fortunately, we don't need to. This patient was uh, coagulopathic. Uh, this, was, this was confirmed to be a hematoma. This did not enhance, uh, and the patient wasn't given contrast, but this patient had gross hematuria, and this, this, was, this subsequently cleared. The only case I, I've ever seen uh, firsthand of a fungal ball uh, so there it is. Uh, this was actually a, a newborn that had cutaneous uh, fungemia, and uh, this subsequently came out in the Foley bag, and this was just a fungal ball. Okay, mural-based filling defects. This is uh, the interesting stuff, the bladder tumors. Um, 
And keep in mind that while most of the tumors we see every day are uh, epithelial, on occasion we'll have a, a non-epithelial tumor that we want to consider, and certainly also metastatic disease. Uh, I've got a few entities here that um, are just rare birds, and one shouldn't spend too much time thinking about them, um, but just for the sake of completeness. Uracal anomalies are out there. It's important that one be familiar with the different manifestations, and I'll show you some examples as well. 90% of bladder tumors are going to be malignant. 90% of those tumors are going to be transitional cell. Probably 10% are going to be squamous, and, and less than 5% are going to be adenocarcinomas. But those tumors that involve the, the uracus remnant, the vast majority of those are going to be adenocarcinoma. And certainly the bladder is the most common site for transitional cell carcinoma. And keep in mind, uh, it's often multifocal, as in this case. So here we see a very large filling defect in the right side of the bladder, but then these were multiple additional sites of transitional cell carcinoma as well. On CT, it can be fairly subtle. I think it's important to just, again, like every other structure that we're responsible to, to take your time and to look at it. I find on the multiphasic study, sometimes the tumors are, are easier to see on the pre-contrast. So even though I think we feel a lot of the time that the only reason we've got the pre-contrast images are to look for the stones, uh, I think they can be very helpful uh, looking at the bladder for pathology as well. Uh, here we can all see that there is abnormal soft tissue density at this left trigone that's extending outside the bladder wall, and this was a uh, locally advanced transitional cell in this area. This is a not-so-subtle transitional cell carcinoma on ultrasound, just a great big giant mass in this woman. Um, again, we'd want to make sure you put on color Doppler to confirm that this isn't a blood clot. And here's a case where if I had just shown you the grayscale, you might give a differential with a few different items. But certainly, once the color Doppler is on, this is a polypoid solid uh, lesion. This is transitional cell till proven otherwise, and it was confirmed at cystoscopy. This gentleman um, was paralyzed and catheterized himself continuously. So this is someone who has repeated urinary tract infections, bladder irritation, and it's really in this group of patients that um, we not uncommonly will see uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, and that's what this was on MRI. Here's a coronal image showing uh, how you lose the normal uh, bladder wall here. Um, you can see the prominent enhancement here, and then on the sagittal images, pre- and post-contrast, we can see this polypoid, uh, brightly enhancing mass that was a squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. Okay, if, if I told everybody, knee-jerk, this is a female, the first thing people are going to say is what? Fibroid, Right. Well, the problem is that this is a male patient, so all of a sudden, because it's a male patient, we all took a step back, and we're trying to figure out what kind of bizarre sarcoma this could be. Um, this mass is huge. It's causing hydronephrosis. It appears to be arising from the back of the bladder. Well, this is a male who has a leiomyoma, so... Um, you know, we would, there's no reason why we should expect a leiomyoma in a male to look different than a leiomyoma in a female. It's just that we don't often see it in, in male patients. But that's what this turned out to be, a benign leiomyoma that was resected in this 35-year-old male. Okay, so this woman, she had had a history of breast cancer and a history of lung cancer. So we're scanning through her pelvis, and these are all new abnormalities. So, you know, bad luck. She's got a third tumor, transitional cell. So she goes and she gets biopsied, lymphoma. So just when you think you've seen everything, um, so now she has lymphoma, breast, and lung cancer, but uh, still shows up for follow-up. So certainly tumors can extend into the bladder and cause problems. Here we have a patient who has a primary prostate cancer, 
growing up from the prostate to involve the right trigone and cause right-sided hydronephrosis. This cystogram was performed on a uh, postpartum patient. Um, she was reported on her prenatal ultrasound to have a bladder cyst. This is actually a Foley within the bladder, and then there's this perfectly round, or apparently almost perfectly round, filling defect. This was a ureteral seal that was nicely demonstrated on CT, and we were able to follow it. And this is the more typical appearance. I think we see in the textbooks the, the cobra head appearance of bilateral ureteral seals. These uh, may be uh, orthotopic or they can be uh, ectopic. Um, and when they don't fill with contrast, uh, as on this case I showed you earlier, um, they can be sometimes difficult to, fill, uh, to, uh, to kind of sort out, but certainly the contrast and seeing them fill uh, is uh, diagnostic. This is a case of cystitis cystica and cystitis glandularis that I show for the sake of completeness. Uh, these entities typically will coexist, uh, and they're characterized by these multiple round filling defects, uh, nodular elevations of the mucosa. Uh, there is an increased risk of bladder cancer in these patients, but if, if we see something like this on, on any type of imaging study, I, I think the patient's going to get cystoscopy and a definitive diagnosis made uh, via pathology. Sometimes we'll have a large filling defect in the bladder that isn't a tumor intrinsic to the bladder, but rather the prostate, as in this case. Here we see a uh, little round focal area of abnormality with the air fluid level arising from the anterior superior aspect of the bladder. This patient had multiple sigmoid clonic diverticula, and so the differential was, was this a focal diverticular abscess or was this an infected uracal cyst? Um, the patient was symptomatic, went to surgery, and this was an infected uracal cyst. So certainly any time we see pathology along the anterior superior aspect of the bladder, whether it's solid or cystic, we're going to think about a uracal abnormality. Um, and certainly if it's solid, an adenocarcinoma needs to be of concern. This patient had focal thickening of the anterior aspect of the bladder, but this was a case of acute diverticulitis adjacent to the bladder. Diffuse mural, uh, mural thickening, uh, it may be neurogenic, can be related to BPH, infection, uh, certainly other entities I've listed here. Uh, TCC tends to be focal, but certainly uh, can rarely be diffuse. This is just a typical appearance of a neurogenic bladder on ultrasound. There's nothing particularly specific about it, just diffuse thickening and a well-distended bladder. This is a patient who clearly has BPH, very prominent mass effect, wall thickening, and then we've got these little areas of uh, trabeculation associated with the wall thickening. This patient had a gynecologic malignancy, received a tremendous amount of pelvic irradiation, and on these T2 and T1 postgadolinium images, this is the bladder wall, very irregular, areas of necrosis. This is radiation-induced cystitis. This is a slide from that patient I had showed you earlier that had the CMV ureteritis. Well, the bladder was also involved, markedly thickened, abnormal enhancement, and so this is CMV cystitis. This is an example of schistosomiasis, which is a parasitic infection. It spread uh, through the bloodstream uh, to involve the bladder and ureters, it causes calcifications, wall thickening strictures, and often straightening of the ureters that can be uh, obstructive. Abnormal shape of the bladder, pear-shaped, pelvic lipomatosis, hematomas. Again, the things that I list here are the same things that I listed that can cause medial deviation of the distal ureters. So again, there's a lot of uh, crossover in these entities and, and, and how they can affect the uh, urinary system. 
uh, and this is a case of pelvic lipomatosis, which is considered an idiopathic process uh, that's characterized by proliferation of fat uh, within the extraperitoneal space. Usually the, it's a symmetric mass effect on the bladder, and it's asymptomatic, um, but it can cause bladder inflammation. It can cause obstruction, bladder outlet obstruction, um, and so, um, but that's certainly very rare. Asymmetric bladder contours. This is a case I saw when I was at the University of North Carolina. This patient presented with episodic gross hematuria. Uh, this first image, uh, or early image, uh, during uh, excretion on the IVP uh, was a little bit confusing. Uh, this was also there on the scout. Uh, clearly, this ureter is being deviated medially. Uh, the bladder also looks like it's being deviated to the right. Uh, if this was a female patient, I think one might think about fibroid calcification, but this was a male patient. So was this some kind of foreign body? Was this some kind of bony abnormality arising from the, the sacrum? Um, but we didn't have to spend too much time because on our next film we saw that uh, this was actually a large bladder diverticulum that had a relatively narrow neck and because of the stasis, this patient had formed a very large stone within the diverticulum. Because the patient was symptomatic, the patient went to surgery and the diverticulum was resected. There was no cancer or any other abnormalities associated with this diverticulum that contained a large stone. On CT, it's important to take a very close look at the uh, diverticula, however, because you can have pathology that forms within them um, other than stones. And in this case, we had noticed that this diverticulum did have a small mural nodule, and this was confirmed to be a transitional cell carcinoma within the diverticulum. Certainly, abnormal contours uh, can be seen in the setting of diverticulitis. Uh, in this case, there was a fistula formation. Here's the coronal reconstructed image where you see the mass effect. Um, when one sees gas within the bladder and there hasn't been instrumentation, certainly the most common uh, causes of fistulization with the bladder, diverticulitis, Crohn's disease, sometimes radiation, uh, neoplastic processes, trauma. This is the most common trauma we see to the bladder uh, at Northwestern. This patient had a radical prostatectomy, and there's a small posterior leak uh, at, the at the neck of the bladder where the anastomosis is made. And this is very common, and they just leave the Foley catherine, and these heal up on their own. Here's an example of uh, abnormal bladder contour related to prolapse. So you can see that even at rest, this bladder is lying well below the, uh, pu the pubic symphysis line, and then with Valsalva protrudes dramatically inferiorly. We've been doing quite a bit of scanning of patients dynamically with sagittal MRI to look for uh, pelvic floor laxity uh, abnormalities, and here's just an example where at rest and with Valsalva, we nicely demonstrate bladder prolapse. And this is my final case. Um, which I've really picked up some speed. Um, and this is a cystogram on the left. And I hope everyone can see what this is. I like to tell the story. I usually like to put that this was a, uh, um, a, uh, a recent immigrant who uh, presented with uh, hematuria and wearing loose pants. Um, and so on the cystogram, you can clearly see that this is the bladder, and this is bladder herniation into the scrotum. And because it was dependent and didn't drain properly, he was prone to recurrent urinary tract infections, and this hernia was repaired, and the patient did just fine. 